the old house here, it's a four bedroom house and uh, built in 1920 by my uh, grandfather, Jern. It was finished around 1920. My grandparents had uh, three kids, Stuart, Chalice and Sophie. Uh, Stuart married Marjorie, my mother, and uh, so in, I think it was 1939 uh, they got married and um, anyway they had, by 1942 they had their first child, it was, uh, he was 13 days old when uh, in this room right here, this is where my parents uh, had, that's the room my parents had and they would have had a crib in there for their 13 day old uh, child. My mother had come up to pick up the child and she said she was carrying the uh, carrying my brother uh, out of the room when she heard a loud explosion. And my mother with the, the baby in her arms walked down this uh, hallway here, the head of the stairs. And she, uh, she would have looked out through this window right here uh, because the, uh, the oar boats were anchored a couple of miles offshore here which was typical anchorage for the oar boats at the time. So she glanced out, that's when she saw the, the, uh, the ship, both ends go up in the air. She spoke many times about seeing that. She never really got over the fact that the ship did that and sank. So then of course, uh, you know, things moved downstairs as things progressed through the day, through the morning or afternoon. Um, they set up a clinic downstairs in the kitchen and they set up a morgue in, in another room downstairs. So why don't I take you downstairs and show you that. Uh, they we're, we're standing here in the kitchen of the old house now and that's the back door right there and you know typically years ago people used the back door uh, to as the as their primary entrance, you know. So the survivors would have been injured people, would have been taken in here. So the locals would have carried them in here and uh, positioned them here in the, uh, in the kitchen. The doctor here, Dr. Templeton was, was here attending to the, uh, attending to the injured. And uh, my mother and grandmother was also uh, assisting the doctor uh, with, uh, with the injured. One of the things that she and uh, they did, which is interesting, at that time in 1942, um, she tells us that uh, instant coffee had just come out. So what they were doing was uh, making coffee for the, for the injured, using the first jar of uh, instant coffee they had ever purchased. <laughs> so anyway, what she tells as well, she said the doctor was attending to different individuals with different um, amounts of injury. She remembers one man underneath this table here and uh, with his arms wrapped around the leg of the table and uh, every now and then she said he would scream very loud. So she asked the doctor why did the man scream, you know, like that. And he said he's in shock. He thinks he's holding on to he thinks he's holding on to something that's keeping him afloat. And uh, so he had a broken leg as well when he was there. So during, during this time that the um, people were, the survivors were being brought in here, some of them didn't make it. And so uh, the doctor, although he tried to revive them, they just didn't make it. So what they did was take the people who died and they set up the room or just use the, the room in here, I'll take you in in a minute, uh, as a morgue. So my mother remembers like having to get things from that room and having to step over uh, these bodies in the room. I think at one point she said there were nine bodies in the room laid out on the floor. Um, and uh, so eventually of course there were people coming along to, uh, to take all of the, the uh, corpse away, you know. Um, so why don't I take you in now from the kitchen over to the uh, to where they put those uh, bodies. So we're walking down the corridor here. 
Although this is the, uh, the main entrance there, but the most of the activity took place in the back entrance. Um, so this is a small room here, um, but my uh, parents, uh, Stuart and Marjorie, uh, when they got married, uh, my grandparents set up a little kitchen here so that they'd have their own place to cook uh, and, uh, and their own privacy. See? So this was like mother's, I'll say, uh, kitchen sitting room combination here. And uh, so this is where they had the bodies laid out, she explains, laid along the floor here, along here. And uh, so she would have to come in to get something she needed for the, and that's how she said she had to step over bodies to do so. Uh, one interesting uh, little side story here that happened uh, when the PLM uh, was uh, sunk, the uh, radio operator on the PLM uh, had his arm broken, couldn't swim, but he owned a dog, and the dog uh, t uh, towed the radio operator to shore. In doing so, they had to swim through, of course, the hot burning oil that was uh, that happened as a result of the explosion, and um, the dog. Uh, burnt the hair off his back. So anyway in the process of looking after everybody here um, the uh, my grandmother went out and noticed a dog outside with the scald uh, with the burnt back. So she took some ointment and she uh, applied it to the burn on the dog's back. So the dog adopted my grandmother uh, and uh, so when everything settled down, the dog was left here with my grandmother. She called him PLM after the ship. And so uh, PLM stayed around for a, a short period of time with my grandmother. The problem she ran into was uh, the dog would, there's a gate to the property here. The dog would let people in through the gate, no problem. But when they wanted to leave, the dog got angry with them for some reason or other we don't understand. So my mother, my grandmother was fearful that uh, the dog might, you know, bite somebody. So she gave the dog uh, away to, I believe, a local uh, businessman here. And he uh, had it for a while and then he, I think, gave it to a, uh, gave it to uh, one of the policemen on the island. So the dog had a, uh, lived a full life after here on Bell Island as PLM.